I'm delighted to welcome Mike Horn to the stage. Thank you, Mike. Well, hi guys. It's um, I haven't been home, and as Cape Town, uh, well, this is where I was born. I call home. Um, I haven't been here for about 20 years, so I'm excited to be back. Thanks, James, for bringing us back to to Cape Town, and it's always I would say it's always great to come back to a city that welcomes people. Um, I'm a professional explorer. I was born in South Africa, um, but had Swiss and South African parents. Um, the better part of my life, I actually lived up in Europe. So um, I live in Switzerland. In Switzerland, um, uh, Switzerland's a country that, um, that likes to set many rules and regulations. And being Swiss, um, sometimes I don't like living by rules and regulations. So I decided that one day, um, you know, I would like to just go out there and explore the world. So for more than 28 years, I've been a professional explorer, being paid to do what I love doing. And I think if we find um, that balance in life, to be able to do what you love doing, then um, you live a happy life. It's not all about how much money you earn, but it's more about the quality of life that you can live. So I left everything behind and then decided that I would like to swim down the Amazon. The Amazon River is 7,000 kilometers long. Uh, I joined the Brazilian Special Forces. I stayed uh, with the Brazilian Special Forces in Manaus for over a year. They trained the Americans for the war in Vietnam. Okay, it didn't work so well for the Americans in Vietnam, but uh, for me it worked. I just wanted to know how to survive. And after one year of training, I started that 7,000 kilometer swim and I lived off nature. I didn't take any food, I just took a hammock uh, and a machete and I kind of hunted to stay alive. And after that I said, well, now that I've swam down the Amazon, why can't I follow the equator right around the world? And I did a, a 40,000 kilometer non-motorized hike and sail, staying exactly on the line, the imaginary line of the equator. That took me two years. And when I came back home, I felt that, wow, now I know more to go even further. And I think that's life. We go out into the unknown and we discover things that makes us push our boundaries. We discover things that makes us step out of our comfort zone. And if we, if we live in our comfort zone, um, we're not really living. I think it's the moment you step out of your comfort zone into the unknown, that's when you start living, and that's where you feel alive. So um, when I was born in South Africa, my father was quite a, quite a sports personality. He was a South African rugby player. And if you know rugby, it's the national sport of South Africa. I was always proud of walking in the street with him, holding on to his hand, and people would come up to him and said, well, you played so well. Um, yes, that's amazing. And as a kid, I had a Euro, and he was my Euro. And when he played his last match, by accident, he scored a try. And it was one of many tries, but his team won. And for me, I thought it was, he made the team win. He was my Euro. And I walked into the changing room with him, and I said, you know, I want to be like you. And he looked at me like this, and he said, what, do you, do you want to be like me? I said, yes, I want to be like you. And he said, you know, Mike, my world is this big, but your world is already as big as that. And at that moment, I believed him. I just believed that I can be bigger. I can do things differently. And when somebody tells you, your euro tells you that you can do things bigger and better, and you believe it, then bigger and better exists. If you don't believe in it, bigger and better doesn't exist. So what he said as well is he said, you know, you can't be anybody else but yourself. And that's the easiest person to be. If you do what you want to do, that comes from your heart, 
then things become possible. If you try and be like anybody else, then it's a difficult, complicated life. We should all be who we are. And that, that personal and that real power that you have inside yourself portrays who you are. That's when life becomes easy. Keep it simple. In simplicity, you can do complex things. My father went running every day of his life. Every day at 6 o'clock in the morning, he went running. As a kid, from 10 years old, every day at 6 o'clock, I waked up to go run with him. Every day. He asked me the question, he said, why do you think I go running every morning? I said, because you want to be fitter, you want to add value to your team, um, you want to be stronger than your opponent. And he said, yes, that's half the truth. But I go running because you are awake. You inspire me to wake up. And I was a 10-year-old kid. All of a sudden, I thought I was the inspiration to his success. And that's the great thing about inspiration. We all inspire each other. And imagine you can inspire older and younger people and open your mind to be inspired by other people. Then the impossible becomes possible. If the will to win becomes bigger than the fear to lose, then you can go out there and achieve amazing things. It's fine to make mistakes. I've frozen my fingers. I broke all the bones in my body, but I always stood up. You only defined by how fast you rise after your fall. We can't always be successful. So in 2006, um, I wanted to do something that no other human being has done. And it wasn't to be the first. It was just to be able to add value to my life because that's what I needed. So after a two-year and three-month circumnavigation solo right around the world, in 2005, I became the first person to ever circumnavigate the world above the Arctic Circle. It took me two years and three months solo. Walked all the way from Norway on the frozen ice across Greenland. Canada, Alaska, across the Bering Strait, all the way across Russia, Siberia, back where I left from. Two years and three months was the most amazing time of my life. I survived two winters with temperatures as low as minus 60. And that gave me the knowledge to attempt the first ever winter expedition to the North Pole. Something that nobody else has done. No book is written about it. You sit in, front of you sit in front of the problem, or if you can call it a problem, but I call it a challenge, with a blank page. And I think often you in your, your life, you, you discover things and you sit in front of a blank page and now you've got to write your chapter of your life. Um, as I was preparing the expedition, I got a call from from a Norwegian explorer, and his name was Borgi Ausland. Borgi Ausland is most probably the world's greatest explorer, polar explorer. And he called me and he said, listen, Mike, um, I heard you want to go to the North Pole. Can, I think we should go together. And I had a little bit of an ego, so I said, you know, Borgi, I think I can do it alone. Uh, goodbye. And I put down the telephone. And that's just how we are. I think a lot of you uh, in your business uh, kind of uh, have the similar mindset. And as I walked away from the phone, I just realized that I just said no to the greatest polar explorer. And I went back to the phone and I dialed the number and I said, hi, Borgi, uh, it's Mike. Uh, I thought about it. And yes, I think we should go together. And you know what he replied? He said, I want to go alone, goodbye. And he puts down the phone. So you've got two guys. I had the knowledge of navigation at night by using time and the position of the stars, while Borgi had the knowledge of the ice, the thickness of the ice, 
where to find water, how to calculate if the ice would crack or not. And that knowledge I didn't have as much as he did. So we needed each other. And I think we all need you guys work in teams as well. And we all need each other's knowledge. To go into the unknown, the best way to go into the unknown is to be supported with people that add value, that you surround yourself with. So Borgi wanted to go alone. I wanted to go alone. And we knew that both of us wouldn't make it alone. So two days went, went by, and I went back to the phone. And as I wanted to call him, the phone rang, and it was Borgi. He said, OK, Mike, let's stop playing around, and let's go together. So that's how we met, met up. I didn't really like the guy, and he didn't really like me. But you don't have to like somebody um, to actually have the same goal. And that's where competition becomes important. Competition in between yourselves, where you challenge yourself, becomes important. And the only reason why we made it to the North Pole, or just, just made it to the North Pole, was every morning I wanted to get out of the tent before he did, to show him I'm stronger to show him that I had more energy. And he wrote a book about it, and I wrote a book about it, and he said exactly the same thing. I hated when Mike got out of the tent before me because that showed that he was stronger. And that competition that we have in between the team makes us grow and makes us motivated. Like I thought I inspired my father to go and run, just by getting out of the tent before him, it inspired him to get out of the tent before me the next day. And that's how we create the energy that we feed off. So just to give you an idea, the North Pole is kind of simple. It's only ice floating on water. It's an ocean. It's called the Arctic Ocean. This is a photo taken from the top of the world as we um, believe that's the top. The Australians believe they are the, on the top of the world, but they always believe that they're on the top of every, everyone else. But if you take the world and north is up on the top and south is at the bottom, this is a photo or an image of what we find around the North Pole. So we've got obviously Scandinavia, Greenland, Canada, Alaska, the Bering Strait, and Siberia. So my first expedition was I left from there and skied right around the world back to Norway. Two years and three months. That's how I prepared myself for a trip that would be only from there to there. Only 2,000 kilometers. But I wanted to do it in winter. And if you look at winter, temperatures drops to about minus 60. But this was a chart set up during the Cold War. You know, the Cold War between the US and Russia. And they said at minus 54, you freeze in less than two minutes and you have to stay inside. But stay inside of what? How can you stay inside of something if there's nothing to stay inside? And that's when I understood that I've got to stay inside my clothing. So I have to eat 12,000 calories a day for my body to heat up my clothing that I can survive temperatures of minus 54. So before you actually go out into the cold, you have to drop your body temperature by going completely naked outside drop the body temperature, temperature to 36 degrees, sometimes 35, just before you get hypothermia and you start shivering. The moment you start shivering, you have to keep your body temperature there because that's the only way you can control the temperature of your body. A shiver burns two or three calories, but it creates four watts of energy. And my body needs four watts of energy. So the... The warmer my body, the more I will sweat. And that would freeze in my clothing, and then I will die. So keeping the body temperature just below normal is the only way to go to the pole. Once you cool down the body, um, then 
you put on your clothing and you're shivering, and the helicopter that's behind us, the Russian helicopter, dropped us off on the last bit of land on the Arctic Ocean. So this photo was taken at 22 minutes past midday, the brightest moment of the day. So if you think of the brightest moment of the day, in the Arctic, there's no sun. For three months, it's complete darkness. And that's what makes it interesting. I think sometimes you sit in darkness as well. If you have to solve problems, if you have to be there and think of, wow, um, where do we go from here? We're sitting in front of a blank page, and we've got to go somewhere. We've got to solve a problem. And it's dark. We don't see anything. But it's only when you make the first step that you can actually start seeing the light. So the Russian helicopter pilot, he didn't want to leave. He eventually, he's got to keep the rotor turning because temperatures are too cold to restart the engines. And he came out to me and he said, listen, Mike, I, I, I can't leave you here. Um, when we go, um, we can never come back. And that Rubicon, that point of no return, is what excites me. I want to be alone. I want to challenge myself. I want to find the solution. And I will only be there because I want to be there. I think you guys are here because you deserved it. It's the same for me standing there. I prepared myself. I trained for 20 years. I had my mind focused. That was the only place I wanted to be. For the Russian, he couldn't understand why I wanted to be there because he was thinking of dying. I was thinking of surviving. And that is important in your group. You guys deserve to be here. Same as I was standing there. And from today on, the show begins. You, exactly in that unknown where I was, that will I survive it? Where will it lead to? And all the energy and all your experience and all your knowledge brought you to this, this point. Your team, together, things become possible. So, the weight that we pull in food and fuel is up to 200 kgs. It's about, I think, 400 pounds. Borgi prepared his expedition. So, in his sled, he's got his food and fuel. I prepared my expedition. My own knowledge was my own experience. The clothing we prepared, it was made for us, uh, for, for us. So he's got his methods, and I've got my methods. But we only share one tent. We only have one tent. One day, I carry the tent. The next day, Borgi carries the tent. And without a tent, you can't survive. So we have to stick together. And I think that is important if you guys work during the next week, is to give people, take the lead, but stick to each other and support each other because you need to sleep together. And alone we cannot exist. So, 20th of January, we were dropped off on the last little bit of land in Russia. This white bit, is a glacier on top of a landmass. This is the Arctic Ocean, ice in movement, breaking up, drifting, influenced by the winds and the currents. The North Pole is up there. Once we leave this point, you can never come back. Once you step off onto the Arctic Ocean, the fight begins. And that's exciting. The moment you decide to engage. I worked with a German football team as the mental coach for the 2014 World Cup. I worked with the Indian cricket team in 2011 as the mental, uh, mental coach. I worked with the South African rugby team as the mental coach. And all of them won a World Cup. The way we think, the way we think is the most important and the biggest change maker in what we do. 
So if you have the right amount of energy and you have the right attitude, that's when things change. If you're afraid of losing, you shouldn't be standing there. It's only when the will to win becomes bigger than the fear to lose that you can step off on the ice. I don't lose money. I don't lose a match. I lose my life. So I engage. And the moment I make that decision to engage is the moment the doors open. So I think you standing at this stage in front of the same door where you have to engage. You're not motivated. I, I'm not motivated every day to pull my sled across ice in complete darkness. It's so dark that you can't see even your sled at the back of you. There's moments that you have to jump from one bit of ice to another bit of ice. And if you fall into the water, it's 5,000 meter deep. You won't survive. But it's obstacles that we have to overcome. And the more obstacles we overcome, the bigger and the better our experience to overcome even bigger ones. So I'm not motivated to get out of the tent every day. And we don't need to be motivated every, way, every day. The, the American way of, of teaching motivation where we say, think positive, think positive, think positive, I see it as bullshit, sorry to use that, because I'm not motivated to go out at minus 50 to freeze my fingers and not make, make it to the end of the day. We don't need motivation in life, we need discipline. And the moment you discipline, that's when things happen. That's where motivation starts. A discipline is something that drives our lives. And with discipline, we can go far. Motivation becomes part of a discipline. And what was important about us is that I didn't have to watch him. And he didn't have to care about me. We knew enough that we were disciplined enough to stay together. Because if Borgi jumps on this bit of ice and it drifts this way, and I jump on this bit of ice and it drifts the other way, we're going in two different directions. And what you need to do to be disciplined enough to drift off in the same direction for the next week, that's all. Because when you drift apart, it becomes very difficult again to find each other. And you've got one tent to sleep in. That's your team. So value those team because that's where you get the support. You have to have solutions for all the problems. And, and you, when the ice cracks, and, and often the ice cracked, uh, we had kind of a dry suit, a dry suit that's behind me that we would put all over, uh, on, over our clothing, and then we would jump into the Arctic Ocean. So I've got a little bit of a video just to show you. The ice is cracking. We put on our dry suit, we zip it up, and without thinking, um, you, you've got to take the leap. You've got to push your sled into the water. You jump into the Arctic Ocean at temperatures of minus 40 degrees, and you swim into the unknown. All you need is balls. Sorry to use those words, but women have bigger balls than men. Sorry, it's just a, a figure of speech. It's courage we need. Don't be afraid to, to jump into the unknown because that's when life becomes interesting. And you guys are constantly in the unknown when you're solving problems. Just know how long you must be in the unknown because the moment I jump into the Arctic Ocean, I know I've got about 18 minutes to live. So I check my watch before I jump in and seven minutes later, I start trying to get back where I came from. And that often is really a good idea. If you deal with a problem, just if it goes too far, too long in a direction that we don't know it's going, just come back to your starting point again. Just reassess, look at it again, and then start from there. That's the easiest way of knowing where you're heading. 
to be close to where the problem started and initiated. So I know that the moment I jump into that water, 18 minutes later, I'm dead. I, I'm not doing what I do to die. I do what I do because that's what makes me feel alive. So although you cannot see much, you just need to see enough. Too much information, sometimes I call useless information. In difficult moments, just to see what you need to see was very, is very important. When I joined the Brazilian Special Forces and they trained me to, to, for survival in the jungle, they gave me a pile of books this high on everything I could eat, everything that I couldn't eat, all the snakes that could kill me, all the snakes that couldn't kill me. And I couldn't study all of that to be in one year. To know all of that, to be able to cross the Amazon jungle was just too much. And I took the book of snakes. The first page had a yellow and a red snake. I looked at the page and I said, wow, the characteristics of the snake. It lives between head height and chest height. It hides behind big leaves. It usually bites you in the face or chest. So I imagined where I would see the snake. I turned the page and there was another yellow and red snake. The first snake was dangerous. It was going to kill you. The second wasn't. So I started flipping the page between the two snakes to see the difference in between how can I de identify the one that could kill me to the one that couldn't kill me? And all of a sudden I realized that why should I know that the snake can't kill me? It can't kill me. It can't stop me. So I started tearing out all the pages of the stuff that couldn't kill me because it wasn't important to know. There's stuff that's not important to know. Focus on what you need to know and what you need to do. A pile of books this high became a pile of books that high. I only knew what I could eat. I didn't want to know what could kill me because I can't eat it. Everything the monkey eats, I can eat. So if you don't know, just look at the monkey. He'll show you what to eat. And if the monkey sits up in the tree and he eats yellow leaves, don't eat the green leaves, eat the yellow leaves. If the monkey sits up in the tree and doesn't eat, climb up the tree and eat the monkey. So we have solution, guys. There is not a problem. There is no solution to a problem. Solutions exist. So even that sometimes we feel we're a little bit in the dark. Borgi and myself. Sorry, I've, James, do I have another 10 minutes? Just, I can, we can speed it up or we can... You know. Borgi and myself had a deal in between our, ourselves in the start. And the deal was that we would not risk our lives to save the life of somebody else. So that was a gentleman's agreement that we had in between ourselves because two dead is worse than one dead and one alive, or we would hope so. So when the ice cracks and you fall into the Arctic Ocean, it becomes very difficult to get out of that ice because that ice forms around your body. It pulls you down to the bottom of the ocean. And if I would want to go and save Borgi, that means that I've got to go onto that thin ice. And he, if he's in the water, I'll go into the water as well. So I cannot risk my life to save his life. The moment he fell, and we, this is just done, we've got a video running, um, uh, the small little video cam running, and this is just a photo from the video that was ac accidentally taken. Um, you can see Borgi's mouth open, the sled going in, and him holding on to his sled for dear life. The first reaction was to go and save him. When I approached, I felt the ice move, and I said, no, I'm going to go in as well. So I turned my back, and I walked away. I didn't want to see what was going to happen to him. And as I walked away, I realized that I won't survive with this guy, without this guy. I need him. I need him to stay alive. So 
to save him is not really to save him. It's to save my life. So quickly I approached, I undid the, the, the rope that's at the back of my sled, pushed the sled as far as I could forward, took the rope, threw it at him, and he got hold of the rope. Now the tug of war of life starts. He's trying to pull me in so that he can get out, and I'm trying to hold on to my sled because the moment I lose my sled, I lose all the food, all the fuel, the tent, the extra clothing, my communication equipment, everything. My life is in the sled. I cannot lose my life. The tug of war of life, ding, 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 eventually he managed to get his upper body onto the ice, and I managed to pull him out. Pulled him on some solid ice. He sat there for a second. I took my sled, I hooked it on, and I walked away. We spoke two or three words a day, maybe, in between us. We lived together 24 hours a day. When you speak two or three words a day, there's not much of a conversation going on. When he got undressed, took his, his dry suit off, he put it in, in his sled and he came up to me and he wanted to talk to me, but I just didn't feel like talking to him. And the evening when we, we, we pitched the tent, he came to me and he said, you know, Mike, I don't want to thank you. And I found it quite strange that he didn't want to thank me because I just saved his life. I said, Borgi, I don't want you to thank me because I didn't save your life to save your life. I saved your life to save my life. And that's the moment we became a team. And I think the strongest team is the team that will win. If you guys can become a team that's ready to save each other's lives, then that team's got a chance of making it. Knowing exactly what your partner is capable of. Not expecting more or less from the person next to you. Makes communication and pressure situations much more acceptable. The moment we became friends was the moment that we started moving forward with leaps and jumps. And the Arctic Ocean, because the it's constantly in movement. We walked for one month. One month walking. And we only made two kilometer progress. As we moved forward, we pitched our tent. And at night, while we were sleeping five hours, the ice just drifted back to exactly where we started from. Then the next day, we would move forward. We would pitch our tent. And the ice would move back. It moved back for one month. After one month, two kilometer progress. And it's going to feel, this week is going to feel like a month for you. You're not always going to move forward. You're going to drift back. But never give up. Nat Geo that was, was sponsoring us or helping us at that stage, they gave us a call and, on sat phone. And they said, you know, Mike, I don't know what you guys are doing, but you only made two kilometer progress. I said, why, well, only two kilometers. But the woman that called us was right. We only made two kilometer progress from the point of, of departure. So I said, just hang on a sec. Can I please send you another signal so you can tell me exactly, exactly how far I've walked? So. I send a signal 40,000 kilometers up. Satellite captures that signal. 40,000 kilometers down to Toulouse in France. Across the Atlantic to New York. She gets my signal nine seconds later. My satellite phone rings and she says, Mike, you've only made 1.8 kilometer progress, not two kilometers. I said, exactly. In that nine seconds, I drifted back 200 meters. Imagine I stayed in my tent for a month. 
I would have been minus 500. Don't tell me I only walked two kilometers. I've walked 502 kilometers. And in your group this week, sometimes you're going to walk long distances but make very little progress. But keep on walking. Keep on finding solutions. Keep on working a little bit harder because that's when the change will come. We sat in a tent and, and, and we decided that we didn't have enough food or we knew we didn't have enough food to make it to the end of the expedition. In our sleds, we had two months of distance to cover with only one and a half months of food. So we didn't have enough fuel to make it to the pole. We couldn't abandon. Nobody can rescue you. You're alone. And when I asked Borgi, how, how are we going to live for the next two months with only one and a half months food? We're going to run out of food. He said, let's eat half the rations. Let's only eat half the rations. At the end, we will have more rations. And I said, I don't think that's a good idea because now we need to make the change. Let's eat double rations now. Let's increase our food intake. Let's become stronger to overcome the obstacles now because later will look after itself, uh, itself. Don't leave things for later. Do it now. And Borgi said, Mike, just eating double rations today and tomorrow to become stronger and not weaker is a good idea, but we're going to pay at the end. So, in the tent, I just thought, I said, the, the, the answer or the solution to the question is quite easy. If we change our biological clock and one hour, uh, one day becomes 30 hours long and not 24 hours like we know it, then we can still sleep five hours a day we can still eat five hours a day because to eat 12,000 calories is what you eat in a week, I must eat in a day. I need five hours a day just to eat my 12,000 calories. I need five, th five hours a day just to recover, to sleep. So if you change your biological clock and you make one day 30 hours long, you can walk for 20 hours. You can progress for 20 hours and still eat one day's food. And then, saving or adding six hours to the day, every fourth day, you gain one day. No? Six hours, six hours, six hours, six hours, you gain one day food. By changing our biological clock, and every fourth day gaining one day, made us progress. So, progression doesn't matter what the weather, how the conditions would be. I love bad weather because I know it can only get better. I don't like sunny days and stuff like that because then it can get worse. I love the bad weather. And often in the bad weather, while the others stay in the tent and you out there progressing, that's when you make the distance. That's when you become bigger. That's when you take advantage over the other teams. If you can perform in bad weather when there's big problems, then you can perform in good weather. Everybody can perform in good weather. But be out there in good and bad weather. Then you optimize, well, life in general. Sometimes you need a very small bit of light to be able to advance. And I love this photo because that's the first day I saw the moon and it was like I had my little light that I needed to progress. All you need is to know one thing. To be sure about one thing if you go, in, go into the unknown. And the rest will get, you'll get to know as you progress. To read the signs is quite important. As you can see, this is polar bear tracks and this is urine. So, 
This is a female polar bear because a female polar bear, she would urinate in between the legs while a male polar bear would urinate in front of the hind legs. Um, normal, you can see when a female went to the toilet in the snow and when a male went at a pee in the snow. You can see where the urine is. So, um, see the signs before you actually, it's too late. A female polar bear urinates because the moment that she needs to feed her cubs and feed herself, she releases all the resources. The size of the track gives the size of the bear. And if you know what that means, then you can prepare yourself. So we knew that was a female polar bear, ready to hunt, that we know. When a polar bear comes up to you and stands on its hind legs, lifts up its front legs like this, opens its mouth, turns the ears like this, lifts its nose up into the air and growls at you, all you need to do is open your stride, swing your arms, walk away, show the bear that you're human. That's why the ears are up there, the mouth is open, the nose is up. See, just accumulating information. Keep on accumulating information as you go along. And the moment that she's got the information, she'll decide what she's going to do. If you answer her by opening your legs and showing her that you're human, you can even speak to her. You'll give her all the information needed to make a decision. The moment when she puts her front legs into the ice, she approaches her hind legs, she pulls a a butt right back into her front. She drops her ears at the back. She closes her mouth. She closes the eyes a little bit. She starts grinding her teeth. The moment she grinds her teeth, she sends adrenaline to the brain and she's going to attack. Read the signs. They're there. And the quicker you read the signs and the faster that you adapt, you will have the advantage. If you're ready to adapt to any situation, you'll always have the advantage above the other teams. So Borgi and myself, we're discussing. I was in the South African Special Forces. I was in the Brazilian Special Forces. I fought three years of war in the bush. Borgi was a Marine. He was a diver in the Norwegian Army. I was quite a good shot. Borgi didn't need to shoot underneath the water. So who's the best person to shoot? Me, obviously. So I tell Borgi, Borgi, please give me the gun. Uh, I'll shoot. Because I'm sure not to miss. Now the bear's busy preparing for the attack. So we're having a small little argument. It's not the moment to have the argument. Choose your moments wisely to differ. Choose the moments wisely. So, Borgi, please give me the gun. I'm a better shot than you. I think I'm the best person to shoot. And then Borgi looked at me and said, no, I'm shooting, you shoot the photos. So, <laughs> this is the gun and the mitten, and I'm next to Borgi um, looking at the polar bear. And I said, Borgi, please, can you take off your mitten because you can't pull the trigger with your mitten. And he looks at me and says, please only give me useful information. So useful information when there's conflict zone is better than useless information, guys. Useless information, um, you don't need to know. So Borgi's got his mitten. I'm taking the photos. The bear's dropping its ears, starting to grind. And I see Borgi preparing for the bear to attack. The moment she moves her jaws, the adrenaline goes, he takes off the mitten and he shoots the bear about a meter in front of us. Now you can see this is Borgi's head. The, we can't kill the bear, we can only shoot a flare, it's just a flame. So the, the flare hits the bear, the bear runs away and you can see the bear um, burning a little bit. In front of us, we've got this massive big fire burning. 
and we protect it. But you can see I'm no longer next to his glove, I'm behind his head and I'm taking the photos like this. So we're protecting ourselves. The bear runs away, makes a big U-turn through the pack ice and comes back. She came back 12 times. 12 times we shot her. And what she didn't know was that we had only 12 flares. If she came back once more, she could have killed us, but she stopped. That's why I say just never give up. <laughs> Guys, <laughs> never, never give up. Keep on shooting. The last bit of the expedition was quite interesting because with the changes in the environment, um, you, you have thinner and thinner ice on the pole. And we weren't drifting back as fast as we did in the beginning. With our 30 hour day, we started advancing quite well. But when the ice becomes too thin and you have to crawl for eight hours a day on your belly, um, you know why you're crawling. You know where you're heading. Never leave, never lose real focus of your goal. Begin with a goal quite wide. Accumulate as much information that's necessary and then start get, getting rid of useless information. Eight hours a day on your stomach, but you know where you're heading. And it's not the easy days that I will remember. It's those days that I had to crawl on my stomach day in and day out for over eight hours. That there wasn't thick enough snow or ice to even pitch my tent. If, you, if something fascinates your mind, the impossible no longer exists. One evening, sleeping in the tent, we're exhausted, we're tired, we've got frostbite, the expedition is slowing down, we're losing energy. I, I always sleep with my ear on the ice and I heard this <coughs> on the ice, a polar bear uh, uh, approaching. Around the tent, we have a trip wire. So the trip wire, the polar bear will go through the trip wire, set off the trip wire to warn us that he's there. Borgi is fast asleep. He's not moving. The bear passes the trip wire without setting it off, gets into my sled, and starts tearing the cover of the sled to get to the little bit of remaining food that I have. He, he pulls the, the sled back like this as he's trying to get because the sled's moving. And the polar bear touches the tent with his backside. The moment he touched the tent with his backside, he sits on the tent. And he sits on my stomach. In between me and the polar bear, we've got two millimeters of nylon. The polar bear doesn't know he's sitting on my stomach. I can't move. All I can move is my elbow and Borgi's asleep. The tent's like this, and the bear's eating my food, and he's sitting on my stomach. I take my elbow, and I say, Borgi, Borgi, please wake up. There's a bear in my sled. And Borgi looks at me like this. He said, what? I said, Borgi, please wake up. There's a bear in my sled. And he looks at me, and he said, why are you waking me up? The bear is in your sled. Not in mine. So guys, the moral of the story, when the bear's in your sled, when it's your problem, it's your problem. It's not somebody else's problem. Solve that problem while the others in your team can have a rest because they're going to solve their problems when the bear moves to the other sled and he's eaten your food. But don't let him eat your food. So Borgi had the gun. So all he does is he hands me the gun. Now the bear is standing up and he's trying to get deeper into my sled. I walk out of the tent and boom, I shoot the bear. The bear runs away. This time it's just a banger. It's just, it's not a flare. It's just <laughs> makes a massive explosion. And the bear shits everywhere and runs away. <laughs> That's a male polar bear. The female polar bear came 
12 times. And sometimes I just don't know why you have to explain to certain females 12 times before they understand. <laughs> but the moral of the story is the females need to feed their cubs. The females are more relentless. They need to survive. While the male polar bear, sometimes they just kill the cubs to be able to mate with the female because the moment that the male kills the cubs, the female goes on heat again and could mate. Well, the female will fight for her life to feed her cubs. Guys, if you have females in your team, you've got an advantage, I promise you. Close to the end, the sun becomes closer to the, the equator, but it becomes colder just before the sun rises. Now, yeah, it's just exposure to the cold for so long. The only way that you can actually heat frostbitten um, extremities is by using ice. So ice is at minus 18. Inside the temperature, inside the tent, it's minus 40. So minus 18 is warmer than minus 40, so you can use ice. People think ice is to cool down drinks. No, ice is actually to heat um, your nose. Um, frostbite sets in everywhere uh, because of exposure. And by the end of the week, you'll feel like this. I promise you. I think that even the knees, the moment you move your, your knee forward and there's no more air insulating um, your, your body from the extremities, that's the clothing, your veins actually freeze inside. The crystals cut the veins and you start bleeding from the inside out. But that's not a big problem. The problem is when you start freezing your cornea when you cannot see anymore, when it's so cold that each breath that you take just freezes on your face. That's why we're there. That's the moment that we are looking for, those moments. Because once you hop through that loop, then things become easier. At the end, just to pull the sled um, becomes a massive task and sometimes you think that you would just let you just want to let go of this thing that's holding you back but that thing that actually holding your back is the reason why you're still alive in your group people should be there to hold you back to be organized so that you can advance slowly but surely everybody pulling together to overcome all your little obstacles and I remember this moment quite well when you fall and you stand up and you fall and you stand up um, and that weight behind you is just holding you back but if you keep on pulling there's a moment that it's going to come and you're going to move forward just keep on pulling it's as simple as that every day when you get out of the tent uh, and you you look at the beautiful Arctic Ocean with all its obstacles, um, motivates me. It inspires me. If life was easy, I don't think it's worth living. The moment when you challenge yourself, that's when life completely changes and have a different meaning. Um, I was married. Um, my wife unfortunately passed away four years, but I had, I've got two beautiful daughters, um, and when I left to the North Pole, the last little story, uh, I asked them to, to draw on the skis. And Annika, my oldest daughter, drew um, the family, my wife, and I've got two daughters, Annika and Jessica. Um, I tried to buy one cat, but you can't buy one cat because um, you need two. If you have a boy and a girl, then you can buy one cat. But if you have two daughters, you need to buy two cats. So I bought two cats. And then the cat went out hunting, and they wanted dogs. So I bought them two dogs. And then it's me leaving. So this is our family. This is our core. Annika said, I wish you good luck. They were born in Switzerland. I was born in South Africa. My wife was born in New Zealand. And 
I'll miss you, Papa. That's what she said. Jessica, on the other hand, drew our little alpage, the, ski, the, the house we live in, the Swiss Alps. She said, I love you. And in summer, we have the most beautiful flowers all over the Swiss Alps. She said, I'll miss you when you come back. I'll take you to an island where you have the sun and the palm tree. God is protecting you. I wish you good luck. And my heart is broken that you leave. The moment I asked her, why did you draw the family, us, and the house where we live on the tip of the skis? They said, each time you move that ski forward, you see the house, and you see us, and you see the house, and you see us come closer. If you keep on moving those skis forward, you will come back home. And if you can do a step that's this far, and not only that, you'll get home e uh, quicker. They said, if you can see the sun and the heart, that means I had to push the ski right forward to there. Then you're working at 100% of your potential. So guys, just keep those skis going forward. Work at 100% of your potential. Fight all the obstacles. And eventually the sun will rise. This is the only photo taken in the world of the sun arising, rising above the equator at the North Pole. It was only done once. And this is the end. Arrived on the North Pole after 60, I think 60 days and 23 hours. So the moment you put the flag on the pole, you've actually done what no other man on Earth has done. And I think that is why you guys are here. Because we're going into the unknown. We're writing history. We're determining the future. And it's all in your hands. Good luck, guys.